The COVID-19 pandemic has fast-tracked innovation in digital health, as so many health services have moved online. And today we're going to be talking about the way that digital health partnerships have helped to maintain health delivery in low resource settings during the past year of social distancing measures. What lessons can we leverage to ensure that digital health innovation advances rather than threatens global health equity moving forward? We'll learn about the Pfizer Foundation's Global Health Innovation Grants, which support community-based social enterprises that strengthen community health systems and use digital technology to facilitate improved care, particularly for hard to reach populations. One of those organizations is Living Goods, a social enterprise, which we've featured here at Prescription for Progress before, that works in Kenya and Uganda, recruiting and training locals to become digitally enabled community health workers. I'm thrilled to be joined by Darren Back, Executive Director of the Pfizer Foundation, Ruth Nagechu, Deputy Country Director for Living Goods in Kenya, and Diana Nakalema, who has delivered basic health services in her community since 2016 with the support of Living Goods. So to start, I'd actually love to begin with Diana. Um, Diana, when I received um, some information about all the services you provide, I thought, I have to list these at the outset. It's just amazing all that she does as a community health worker. But I thought, better to hear from you. So uh, can you tell us, Diana, a little bit more about your work? And let's start pre-COVID. Um, then we can get into the challenges of COVID-19. But what are the services you provide to your community on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, first of all, we treat children under five years. Uh, we first test for malaria. We treat, uh, we treat di diarrhea and also pneumonia. We make follow-ups of pregnant women. We also make up, we also make up follow-ups of their newborns in the community. And uh, we also refer for those, for, those, for those clients whom we find that they have side effects, danger signs, we refer to the health facilities for further medication. And I, one of the things we're going to get into in this conversation is um, the way that the Smart Health app is a tool that actually enables you to do your work more effectively. But can you just tell us a little bit more about how you do all of this work um, in a digitally enabled way, as we talked about before, uh, with the Smart Health app? How does that help you? We are, yes, we are using the smartphone network and of which we, we get a problem at times in synchronizing. At times our data, we, we, it takes a lot of time to reach that data and also to synchronize. And also the air times at times is, is small, small and the data is also less. We are, we are using the app to help us to, to treat the children under five years <clears throat> and this app is also helping us to assess the children in this era of COVID-19 of which it is it is helping us to reach our assessments to, uh, to our supervisors and also we can easily assess by phone and also by, by phone if you assess by phone the app is also helping us to, to streamline the, the assessments on time so that it can give us the easy flow of our work. Thank you, Diana. So it sounds like the app um, presents some, some opportunities in terms of um, being able to assess information on the go, but also there are some challenges, as you mentioned earlier, with, with data. Um, so we'll get back to some of those challenges as well. Um, and Ruth, I'd love to hear from you about COVID-19, its impact on, on the work of community health workers um, and, and what you're seeing on a country level. And then we'll, we'll bring Darren into the conversation to, to hear how the Pfizer Foundation is working with Living Goods on some of these challenges. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, just as, as you know, globally, uh, the work of uh, community health workers have been affected by COVID-19. And not only health workers, it is across the board for all healthcare workers. So we have seen a uh, need for continuity of care well as also trying to control the spread because everybody is uh, can actually be able to spread, including our healthcare uh, providers who are the community health workers. So uh, the Smart Health app has come up, has come in uh, very timely in terms of supporting the continuity of healthcare service delivery. And as, as our, my colleague, I, I am a community health champion, so she's my colleague in the field, has indicated 
the, the tool has really helped them when it comes to delivery of healthcare services. And one way that we have uh, worked with, uh, with them is um, as we try to protect them, we are also ensuring that they are able to provide those services and one of the ways that we've done so is what we are calling the, the, the no-touch protocols. And the no-touch protocol is whereby the community health worker can be able to offer services while us not coming in direct contact with the, with the client. So from our end, as, as, as living goods, we have equipped them in a way that uh, the digital tools are automated and uh, they are able to support the case management, case identification, and and uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that the protocols are standardized, and that reduces uh, any guesswork that comes with the uh, with paper-based system of working. To a greater extent, our community health workers have been able to use these tools to list her mothers, as she has indicated, and support them remotely by uh, following them up through phone calls and SMSs. And also, when it comes to assessment of the, of the children under five, they've been able to continue working and offering those services. Like in Kenya, I can tell you, we've had uh, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, has presented an opportunity where we have seen an increase. We have had a spike by 85% of the people that we are taking care of. We've seen an increase in demand and services that have been um, offered by the community health workers. We can attribute that to the fact that some of the clients are a bit, were a bit worried about uh, seeking services at the health facility. So our community health workers came in handy to support them. And also being that they can actually be able to get them at the time of need, they've, they've really supported uh, these um, households as, as, as we would envision. So um, using the, 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 the digital tools and um, helping the communities, uh, we've been able to ensure that we have delivered services um, remotely. And also uh, one of other thing is that when it comes to supervision, our supervisors have been able to follow up with the community health workers and ensure that we are maintaining the supervision levels that they need to be able to um, deliver. And uh, that way, uh, one of the ways that we've done so is uh, through SMSs and uh, even using things like um, like WhatsApp groups where the, the people have been uh, put together in, in, in a group and they're able to speak to their supervisors and to speak to each other. Uh, then on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the side of interruption of COVID transmission, we've been able to support the community health workers and the household through ensuring that uh, they have uh, what we call a, a, a daily symptom um, checking on uh, for, for them to make sure that they are able to check themselves and for symptoms of COVID. And uh, through it, we have had some few who have actually uh, uh, been able to be identified in time and uh, they went for COVID tests. Some of them tested positive, not very huge numbers, but at least through that protocol that we came up with, our staff and our community health workers do check themselves before they go out to the field to ensure that we are making sure that we don't become uh, uh, carriers of, of the virus as we, we offer the services. And uh, the data that we are getting is also helping us to uh, make decisions, not only us, because it is being transmitted to the government system, where we are making, uh, we are helping in the decision making. And this is uh, the COVID data for surveillance and also the service delivery data for us to be able to see how we continuously support the community health volunteers, uh, the way we call them in community health workers, and also offer incentives for those who are working. We can actually be able to tell who is working and who is not working. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. That's really interesting to hear how the data is useful, not just in the hands of community health workers um, or in the hands of organizations like Living Goods, but actually, for, for larger health services, for, for government knowledge of what's happening in the country. Um, I think that's really, really a useful insight. So thank you for that. Darren, I wanna bring you into this. I know you've seen some of this work up close in Kenya and Uganda, and I'd love to hear more about your view on the important role that digital tools can play for community health workers and the kind of support that the Pfizer Foundation is providing to living goods 
and, and to other organizations in this space who are not only working to ensure that services continue, that healthcare services continue, but that we don't have these huge health backslides in critical areas like maternal, newborn, and child health. Sure, yeah, um, and thank you. So I've been, as you said, I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to visit Ruth and Diana in Kenya and see their work in action and actually go out with um, community health workers as well as the team in Uganda. And it's truly incredible and I think sort of not doing enough justice in terms of how you've both described it thus far. I mean, it, the program addresses so many barriers, which I can only imagine are even more important now with regards to, um, to COVID. So just with the, the digital health platform itself, as Ruth and Diana have explained, you know, it not only provides the algorithms for providing direct care and, and linking, um, linking communities to referral services if they need that, but there's the back end data as well, um, which goes both to the government, but then also for the supply chain within living goods. But also from my perspective, what was so important as well is the trust, the trust and the respect. Now, when I, when I was with Diana and we were visiting from house to house, it was so clear that every community member really did trust and value the expertise of the community healthcare workers and the advice that they were giving. And so I can only imagine that in these times of COVID, especially when there's so much misinformation around, that that access point becomes even more critical. So there's the technology itself, but then there's also, you know, the trust and the respect and the access that, um, that the community has to, um, to, to the community health workers. And so, as you said, we've, um, in the Pfizer Foundation, we've, we've certainly recognized the value of digital health technology. There, of course, has been a proliferation of digital health tools and they've become even more important now in the world that we live in with pandemics. Um, so Living Goods, we've supported through one of our programs, which we've been running for five years, which is called the Global Health um, Innovation Grants. And we have many partners across 16 countries uh, many of which are working directly in communities using digital technology in a similar way to, um, to living goods. And then more broadly, just recognizing the need for scale and for impact, we've actually entered into a partnership um, called the Health Worker Training Initiative. And that's in partnership with Living Goods, with Last Mile Health, the Gates Foundation, and then several other of the pharmaceutical peers, because we recognize that we need to really pull those resources together, learn very quickly about what works and what doesn't work, and then scale that, scale that so it can really provide quality health delivery. I wanted to follow up on, on this um, healthcare worker training initiative. The goal is to provide access to healthcare for nearly 1.7 million people and advance progress toward universal health coverage. So I wanna better understand what are the opportunities and limitations of um, remotely training community health workers. So we've talked about digital as a tool for community health workers to go into communities, but now let's talk about digital as a tool to train community health workers. So um, anyone who wants to jump in, whether it's Diana, Ruth, or Darren, I'd love to hear your view on, um, you know, how does digital enable greater scale in training community health workers, but are there limitations when you take away that face-to-face -face training? So I, I can jump in first, um, sure. and obviously Ruth and Diana are the experts, but certainly from my vantage point, what I've seen is, and, and you're right, I mean, Catherine, you, nothing takes away the value and the impact of face-to-face -face training, for sure, and it's, it's very important. But in times like these, with the pandemic, even more so, we need to provide rapid, rapid information. And that information oftentimes is changing, it's changing daily. And so the value there of digital tools is that you can, you can provide that information in the hands of community health workers as quickly as possible. Um, and the tools are tailored to really deliver that in the most appropriate way for that particular organization, those particular community health workers, and then they can deter how to deliver that information and use that within their communities. So that's what we've seen. I think that really underpins the idea of scale, right, is that you really can reach so many community health workers. And as you said, through, yeah. the, um, through the partnership that we have on running, the hope is to, 
to train two and a half and um, two and a half thousand healthcare workers to reach 1.7 million people over the next three years. Ruth, I saw you might want to jump in on that as well, just in terms of opportunities, but also challenges when it comes to remote training. Yes, thank you. Um, in addition to what uh, he has just indicated, um, this, uh, the, the, the platform provides for self-paced uh, uh, learning where the learners can, can actually be able to interact with the platform at their own pace. And like in the, in the, in, in the physical uh, classroom where you, you don't know when to ask questions and for the, for the slow learners, it becomes a challenge for them. But now this is so contextual that I can be able to place myself depending on my understanding and it is contextual and uh, customized. Then the other thing is that um, it can enhance uh, performance management because of uh, the little time. Uh, you can actually be able to evaluate uh, the learners little time uh, as, as they learn and uh, you are able to institute mentorship for those who are slow or those who have challenges. It is, it is easy to monitor and, uh, and, and, and evaluate whether you're impacting knowledge or not. And then uh, it has also increased the peer-to-peer -peer, um, learning and coaching because I can actually be able to interact with my, my peers and ask questions uh, without really feeling what other people would think about me because I can reach up my hand and ask a question. So it is really, it, it, it has a lot of advantages and I think the COVID uh, situation has really brought about very good innovations in the way we are going to continue doing our our training of the community health workers and just to literally it the speed at which you're able to intervene and give messages and like when you have people together to be able to train them. Thank you Ruth. I wanted to bring Diana into this. Diana I'm curious in, in what ways are health workers like yourself involved in the design of these tools? I'm curious if, if, your, if your input has been a part of the process or how, how have these tools kind of come onto your radar? Were they just presented um, as tools you can use, or have you been able to, to give some thoughts as to how they might work better? Me and my, me and other community health workers, uh, we make focus group discussions. After making focus group discussions, our supervisors come and they interrupt, they observe. After, after observing, they, they go and take back the feedback of which feedback can help us to design other ways of making our work easy, and they also, it, which also helps our work to run on smoothly, as to be to be fair in living goods. So as we can design, they design and make our work to be smoothly. Yes, that's really great to hear that feedback is part of the process. So thanks for sharing that. Um, when we opened up this conversation, we talked about reaching the last mile. And I really want to narrow in on um, that challenge and the role that digital can play. Um, so Ruth, maybe I'll go to you on this. And, and you gave us a bit of a preview, but um, maybe if you can provide some specific examples of some of the challenges of reaching the last mile and, and the role that digital has played in helping living goods um, address that challenge. Can you just give us that, that view on a country level? Thank you. I can give examples from Kenya where we are working in different contexts. Uh, we have a county that is in a nomadic context. And for you to reach the households, maybe two households, you have to travel several kilometers and depending on the needs, where the needs is. But with the digital tool, actually you can reach so many uh, clients at the same time because you don't have to go uh, to, to travel long distance or walk long distance to, to reach your clients. The, and, 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 and this has really improved on how efficient our, 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 our community health workers are being able to do the work. And as I said, we've had a spike on service delivery that is being offered by the community health workers, almost doubling uh, the efforts that we had last year, courtesy of the use of the digital tools. The other thing is that um, uh, with the, the speed at which you are able to get data and uh, more so in responding to COVID-19 and, uh, and the example that I've given of self-assessment for our, for our staff and the community health workers and being able to identify because they have been trained on what the checklist on what to check out for. We've been able to identify cases like when we want to do trainings, you know, 
uh, this trainer cannot go out because of, 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 of the challenges that they have. And maybe when they test, they realize that maybe they, are, they, they haven't been infected. And that way we have actually been able to, to curtail the spread given that our community, those who have been found to be positive, uh, they, 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 they've been uh, able to, uh, to, to abstain from, uh, from, from, from uh, mingling with other community health workers or other trainers. And that way we have curtailed the spread. And uh, lastly, uh, the digital tools have helped us in terms of authenticating the work of the community health workers, real time data. You can be able to tell who is working and who is not working. And it goes with, we have set KPIs for them. We are able to see and track. Uh, they being able to hit those KPIs for those who are not being able, you're able to support them uh, if they need any support in terms of mentorship. If you're able to do it in a speed, in a speedy way, other than if you did have the digital tools and as I've said the information that generate or the data you then generate actually since it is it, it is generated in a timely way it is uh, supporting in decision making and we have seen when it comes to like qualification of products that they need it has really improved even from our side and the side of the government for the communities that they want. Thank you. It's just so interesting speaking with you all at this moment in time because for a few years now I've written about uh, again, living goods and last mile health and their their whole vision of a digitally enabled community health workforce. And now just to see how essential that's been in the past year and hear about the opportunities and challenges. It's really fascinating. Um, Darren, I'm wondering if you can help put this partnership into a larger context of some of the work you're doing this year. And what are you learning in terms of the role of digital in continuing health services, um, the role of digital in ensuring that we don't have these horrible health backslides that are real um, risks this year um, and the role of digital and universal health care. How does this living goods partnership fit into the larger context of the way you partner and the way you see digital? Yep, for sure. Um, well, I mean, I think you made a very important point, Catherine, in terms of digital is really enabling response that we're seeing at the moment, both to COVID, but also to ensuring the continued service of basic and essential health services and really that is key. I mean, I saw data last year that estimates of up to 6,000 children die in a day now because of disruptions um, to lack of uh, access to the vaccine programs. And, and we saw with Ebola, right, in West Africa in 2014, 2015, is that really what's key is that absorptive capacity of the healthcare system to be able to deal with the shocks with epidemics or pandemics like we're seeing now. And I think, digital tools are really one of those solutions to be able to do that. Um, and I think living goods is a perfect example of that on all areas, both in terms of the delivery of quality services, but then the back end, the data that's, um, that's coming through to inform health delivery as well. And what are some of the sort of the key barriers that still need to be addressed? Um, I think more broadly, this has now really challenged the global health community. Um, and it's an incredible opportunity. It's, it's a really important moment in time that we can't miss. Um, and so we've all been challenged to think very differently around what do partnerships look like? Um, and really, how do we play to our strengths? I mean, in this situation, we all have the same goal, which is ensuring that we get quality health services to people who need them. Um, but within each context, it's very, very different. And as an organization like Pfizer and the Pfizer Foundation, we have a lot of resources available to us, but then the insights and tools that are available to living goods are very different, um, as are from many multilateral organizations as well. And so I think what we're seeing now is this, this agreement that we all need to work together in similar and also explore very different ways of working um, and non-traditional ways as well. I mean. I recently joined the board of the, uh, the Bay Area Global Health Alliance in, um, in San Francisco. And really that was the rationale is because we recognize that we global health barriers cannot be addressed alone. And we all have to think very, very differently. And the tech community in the, in, in the Bay Area plays a huge role in that. And so how can we bring those forces together in terms of the skills of NGOs, 
the pharmaceutical sector, and then the tech and digital sector as well. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll, we'll, we'll continue to see this growth and we'll continue to see this sort of very quick learning, quick application in terms of addressing the barriers that we see. Thank you, Darren. That's a beautiful articulation for uh, the reason the Bay Area Global Health Alliance exists and the reason that this Prescription for Progress event takes place as well is bringing people together across sectors to advance global health. So thank you. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left as much as I'd love to continue the conversation. Would love to go back to each of you for very quick reflections. Something you heard another panelist say that you'd like to reiterate or a final call to action for our audience. Um, I'll, I'll share from my end, uh, it was trust. When Darren mentioned trust and how do we play to our strengths, um, I think that is something community health workers have in their communities that um, is, is unique and powerful and something to be leveraged. And digital can help, but trust is essential. What about reflections from you all? Diana, Ruth, do you wanna jump in? Just a quick thought or a quick message for our audience? Yes, I can come in and um, this, uh, what Diana said, the power of digital tool in, at the hearts of the community health workers, uh, what it can be able to help them do. And like when they don't have these tools, uh, and one of the things that came out is the standardization of what service package they're offering. That leads to a standardized approach and also standard quality care. Thank you, Ruth. And then for me, I mean, partnerships, obviously key, it's critical and fundamental to all of this and everything that we've done within the Pfizer Foundation. But at this particular conversation, what really stands out to me is, is Ruth talking about the back end, the data and, and how Living Goods is now using that in a surveillance capacity. Um, and we really need to focus in on that, especially now with the pandemic is we have to think innovatively about how can we get surveillance data through some of these digital tools that's really going to optimize service delivery um, that organizations like Living Goods and governments in terms of how they're using that data. Well, Darren, Ruth, Diana, thank you all so much for your time. And I'll say, while I wish we could be together in person, um, one of the really powerful things about the virtual platform and digital tools is that we can all be here together in conversation from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, we thank Living Goods so much as community health workers. We also thank you for the PPEs that they have managed to give us, which help us in the community. We also thank for the phones, for the phones because they have helped us to identify COVID patients in the communities and also making referrals to the health facilities. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Diana and Ruth. I think, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the work that you're doing um, here in the US and in, and in other countries all around the world. So thank you for, for the incredible work you provide.